So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nyara Zomugodi from the University of Zimbabwe. I would like to welcome you to day two of the um, HPTN regional uh, conference. So um, yesterday we had an amazing, amazing day. Uh, we had uh, four great speakers four or five. We had the state of the network address from Mike Cohen. We had um, tutorial uh, designing clinical trials from Debra, which I still don't remember. It's a very difficult topic. And she's smiling. She knows it's a difficult topic for all of us. But Harriet also took us through the, uh, the successes and the gaps that are remaining as we in the region strive towards reaching 95, 95, 95. She did a wonderful job. And Saika took us through HIV prevention, the landscape in the region. And she talked about uh, some of the challenges that we are facing in the region, another beautiful talk. And Niru, whom I can't see at the moment, uh, but she talked, uh, there she is, she, talk, she took us through um, the network, the network's agenda. And as she was speaking, I was also looking at the gaps that we as HPTNers um, need to fill. So we really had a great day yesterday. And then later on, we had the breakout sessions and we are hoping to hear more from the breakout sessions as the meeting progresses. And also thank you to all site staff I was really impressed by the, um, uh, the sharing of the lessons learned in terms of retention, in terms of what other strategies should we as HPTN use um, to retain, to go into communities uh, for adherence. So well done and thank you to site staff. And please keep um, those uh, uh, lessons learned and the best practices, keep them coming. You can even email them to leadership uh, if there were some which were not discussed. So today we also have a, um, a great panel of speakers. Deborah will be moderating. Um, we have uh, this plenary followed by a breakout session. So today is slightly different. We've got two breakout sessions. And the icing on top of the cake is uh, we've got a reception this evening. If you look at the backs of your IDs, there are two complimentary drink tickets. So please put on your dancing shoes and join us at 6.30 so that we can connect and we can network. Uh, it's a, it seems as if people hadn't realized that we've got free tickets at the back. So our first speaker today is um, Nigel. He's going to be talking about new STI prevention agents and diagnostics. Uh, Dr. Nigel Garrett, he's the head of HIV pathogenesis and vaccine research at Caprisa in Durban here in South Africa. And he's also an associate professor in public health at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. He's a specialist physician in HIV and sexual health. If I read what I have for Garrett here, uh, for Nigel, we are going to spend the whole day, but Nigel. <laughs> Thank you so much, Adzo. Um, so this is the first time for me at an HPTN conference. I'm one of those HPTN people who are jealous of all the work you're doing and uh, all these effective products you're coming up with. And I also realized that Myron has just joined the Carbotegravir table. Um, he, he, he was meant to introduce us, I think. Um, so yeah, thanks so much to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, SDI new agents and vaccines, but uh, also to give you a bit of a the landscape of SDIs in, in our setting and how it relates to HIV prevention, particularly in Southern Africa. So uh, what is the key finding or take home message really here? Challenges remain with SDI care, we all know that, but there are new opportunities um, for research and implementation with these new technologies and vaccines. And we started that discussion yesterday. And how does the research advance HIV prevention efforts so other STIs increase the risk of HIV acquisition. That's very clearly defined now, uh, which means STI solutions are key to HIV prevention. So we need to incorporate it in all our discussions. So very briefly, the outline is the STI burden and challenges of STI care in Southern Africa. 
then to look a little bit at point of care diagnostics. Uh, and I'm going to use the work we've done at Capri just to illustrate that a little bit, um, how we looked at genital inflammation and then also in reducing HIV risk. And then look at briefly at the SDI vaccine pipeline and then uh, briefly try to summarize the doxypep story and the way forward. I think the most important news we all had was that this lady, Jeannie Marazzo, was elected the new Tony Fauci last month. I don't know whether you all know her, but you probably do, many of you. Um, so we've got great hope. All of us at Caprisa are big fans of her. She's done some wonderful work in STD, uh, in STD diagnostics, but also the micro microbiome field and HIV risk. So this is one of the uh, uh, papers she's actually written with others, and you can see this on the WHO website, but it's really just showing the huge amount of burden of STIs um, across the globe, and particularly again in the African region. And one thing just to highlight here to everyone, HIV is also an STI. Sometimes we forget that when we talk about it, um, especially also funders need to realize that, that we're talking about an SDI and we need to really look at it as a package of prevention rather than just one disease. Um, if we look at it in South Africa a bit more clearly, this is a nice study by uh, uh, Ramnini Kularatni from the NICD. It's just, this is data up to about 2018, 19, but essentially it shows the, the plateauing of, of uh, the prevalence of STDs over the years. So since we started working in 1980s on HIV, I don't think this has changed very dramatically. Uh, we're still seeing amongst young women uh, chlamydia rates of about 15% at screening, and that's screening anyone off the street. So I think that's far too high. Amongst men, it's slightly less. Um, so we're seeing a lot of asymptomatic, obviously, infections in, in women. So this is just an old photo from 2016 by us where we organized an STD workshop. And I think many of you maybe have been at these workshops where you perhaps discuss syndromic management. And we, we came up with this little uh, editorial um, about, you know, has syndromic management now used to, uh, reached its use by date? Um, so, you know, in the SDI field, we've got two camps. One are the reformists and some are the revolutionaries. So if you want to change the world, you've got to decide how you do it. And I think at the moment, this SDI field is kind of split between the two. Uh, I, I'm definitely in the revolutionary camp. So, so maybe when, you, when I speak, just take it with a pinch of salt. But I think we need to move away from syndromic management. It's had its role treating bacterial ulcers and so on has been very successful at that. But again, HS, HSV, less effective. And particularly if we look here among uh, young women with, with uh, vaginal discharge syndrome, uh, this is a nice study from actually 10 years ago from Koleka Mlesana, who's now head of research at the NHLS, showing that essentially seven out of 10, seven out of eight women remain undiagnosed with STDs. And then there's this huge amount of overtreatment, about 60%, two out of three women get treatment for without having even an STD. So there are obvious advantages to syndromic management, less expertise required, immediate treatment, obviously lower cost. It was almost meant to be implemented with surveillance programs, but unfortunately we haven't prioritized them, I think. And that has really led to this problem that clinicians have dumbed down. Laboratory people don't know what an STD is anymore. Uh, funders don't understand how STDs relate to other conditions. And, and we've got this, um, this hidden burden of potential uh, antimicrobial resistance now emerging. So uh, Koleka then moved on. She basically, this is again from 10 years ago, but these data don't change. So we started an acute infection study and many of you have done similar studies across Africa um, where we see this enormous amount of high SDI rates at, at acute infection with chlamydia again, about 15, maybe to up to 20%. Trichomoniasis here is quite high. But the other important point is bacterial vaginosis. And it's another talk, but the prevalence of BV is about 30, about a third of women have BV who you screen. Then there's this other third is intermediate flora, which or microbiota, which is kind of ill-defined. And then, so that is a big issue. We talk about um, STD prevention, 
we also need to think about STD associated conditions like BV. The main point here is that the here, uh, Lindy Masson looked at comparing asymptomatic with symptomatic uh, STDs and both uh, caused a certain level of genital inflammation. So we thought um, that both are relevant for HIV risk. So what we then did is we uh, designed the study. Can we have an enhanced STI management study where we uh, essentially throw everything at a person that we can at the time and then see whether we can reduce genital inflammation? So we did uh, the latest point of care testing that started in 2016, immediate supervised STI treatment. And then we added uh, expedited partner treatment, which has been rolled out across the US, um, more or less successful in different states, but it's definitely an exciting uh, behavioral intervention. Uh, there's, you can read a little bit more there, but essentially then to reduce genital inflammation and then uh, HIV risk. So this is where I usually ask the audience to tell me what the organisms are. Um, Hasby is in the audience. <laughs> so we've got, uh, obviously I'll just go through it, but it's quite important to remember what STDs actually are. So this is trichomoniasis with the flagella. It's actually not a bacterium um, parasite. This is a classic BV, gram stain with a clue cell and lots of anaerobic bacteria. So if we talk about bacteria in the vagina, there's lots of other things like Gardnerella, Prevotella that are all important for HIV risk. Here we have the gram-negative diplococci, which is gonorrhea, and then the classic corkscrew appearance of syphilis on a dark round microscopy field. So we used uh, microscopy, the awesome assay, which is a lateral flow assay for trichomonas, and then obviously gene expert, which many of you are using, and added this EPT pack intervention. Uh, we evaluated all these tests, and they're pretty good. So point of care tests nowadays are excellent, especially the PCR-based ones. The awesome assay is a lateral flow, so sensitivity is always a little bit lower, to about 75%, but overall it's a very cheap test, can be done clinic-based, 10 minutes, definitely a good, uh, good assay to use. So what we saw again then, these are, uh, again, students of basically recruited in the community, uh, HIV negative, and again, very high rates of chlamydia. Apparently around Cape Town, people reported prevalence of up to 40% in their communities. <clears throat> high BV rates again. So what we did then is we did these test of cures and managed to um, essentially cure most of the women. You can see here, oh, uh, three of them, three of them remain positive at, at six, six, at 12 weeks. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it showed that we can basically clear them. And what's nice is we, we did cytokine assays and we, we did manage to reduce pro, pro inflammatory cytokines, IL-6, IL-1-beta and TNF-alpha and others, um, clearly and, and shown that as well. The, the EPT is again, another talk, and I think maybe someone else should present that at another time, but, um, I'm, I love it. So 87% accepted EPT mainly for one partner. A lot of our young women actually don't have many, many partners. They've got one or two partners. 89% state they successfully uh, delivered EPT and the partner took the treatment. 17% of women and 6% of partners experienced mild side effects perhaps expected according to antibiotic profiles. There were no allergic reactions reported. And the big thing here, there was no social harm at all. Uh, reported by any of the women. So mm -hmm. we did a whole qualitative analysis. I know others have done this here now as well in Zimbabwe and other places. It, the overall impression I get, it does empower women. It does not take power away or threaten them. So uh, I definitely think it's a great intervention to use. Um, so we then obviously uh, created in all our sites, and I recommend this to everyone, uh, little site labs um, where we introduced this model of care. Uh, and this is a study we just published where we work with our colleagues from SAMRC in KZN, where they used the awesome assay, uh, but centralized uh, chlamydia and gonorrhea testing. And we used our point of care platform. And here in blue, you can see uh, the treatment start rates at the SAMRC sites, 
and obviously point of care, you can give the treatment immediately. So I think what's maybe not ex unexpected is that people come in over the next two weeks and then slowly get their treatment. But I think what's very important is this part here, the 30% that never come back and never actually get their treatment. So maybe that's another additional benefit of point of care testing. Um, the pipeline is obviously super rich. Uh, many of you probably getting currently approached by companies to evaluate their assays. Um, so I think um, why not do it? You know, you can start a, a little program in your clinics and then uh, maybe introduce these assays. The main focus is obviously, I think it's important to have accurate uh, assays. They need to have a fast turnaround. The gene expert is a little bit slowish. 90 minutes is it's kind of a bit too long. Um, so I think 30 minute assays are now definitely coming out and that, that's probably fine uh, for a very accurate PCR assay. Uh, simple to operate and affordable. You may need a lab technician. So how have we moved this forward in South Africa? We have now uh, written new guidelines um, that are uh, kind of targeted at everyone, uh, obviously private GPs, but also uh, try, trying to incorporate or be aware of the Department of Health guidelines, but be slightly more ambitious. So we've added a lot of diagnostic care in there. Um, the other thing we, we just did with the government is to write this uh, national strategic plan, and we managed to put in very concrete targets for all common SDIs, and particularly also HPV uh, prevention and treatment, obviously, and Hep B uh, and Hep C Hep B vaccination, also Hep C treatment. So there's a lot hopefully going to happen in the next few years. In terms of vaccines, um, the WHO has, has set out a clear kind of vaccine roadmap, um, you know, to obtain better epidemiological data on STDs, to model the, the potential impact of these vaccines on the condition itself, maybe complications like PID and perhaps also HIV. Uh, incidents, encourage more investment in the field, advance basic science and translation research, and maybe that's where HPTN could play a role, uh, expedite the clinical development uh, and evaluation, define preferred product characteristics, and then obviously plan for the vaccine introduction. Uh, if we look at the pipeline now, um, some exploratory uh, vaccines for trichomoniasis, uh, preclinical work for syphilis vaccines, there's a phase one chlamydia vaccine out there now that's being tested. Uh, HSV2 vaccine development has been ongoing for some time. Uh, I think I've heard some more promising noises recently. Um, the gonorrhea vaccine, everyone is talking about the uh, meningococcal vaccine at the moment, but um, it's possible that the companies are also looking at gonorrhea itself. Obviously, it's easier to market a product that can uh, kill two birds with one stone. Um, here is a uh, antibody kind of response chart. We're all used to them now post-COVID. Um, at the top is an ELISA assay, and here is a neutralization assay, and you can see this uh, chlamydia vaccine, <clears throat> which was a protein, protein vaccine, elicited uh, very strong antibody responses after uh, three um, vaccinations and then two um, nasal inoculations. Uh, and on the right, you can see the placebo groups it was slightly better with a liposomal adjuvant compared to the alum adjuvant. Um, this, this can go forward into a larger trial. Um, if you model this, um, obviously, vaccines is always, if you have 100% vaccine, you could maybe eliminate a, a condition after about 15 years. Um, but here you can also see the impact on yeah, chlamydia prevalence, but also on PID cases that would also uh, uh, go down. Uh, Baxero is an interesting study, and we should probably get uh, Deborah to talk about the design of the study. Um, but it's uh, essentially a retrospective case control study where they looked at uh, gonorrhea cases and then used chlamydia-only controls. And then they looked at who had the meningococcal vaccine. Essentially, it's like a, um, and found this 31% reduction in uh, new gonorrhea cases amongst the, um, yeah, the, the cases. 
So I think lots of other people are looking at this at the moment, and I hear Myron is also keen and the HPTN to get involved, which is great news. Uh, I'm not sure whether GSK is thinking of a, a gonorrhea vaccine itself, so actually improve on Vaxera, but um, I mean, that would be amazing as well. Uh, there's a lot more funding going coming through, and I hear that the first uh, big awards by the NIH were awarded, and one of them is um, University of North Carolina. Uh, Myron, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure whether you're part of it, um, but that's that's very promising. So two gonorrhea vaccine, large trials, syphilis and chlamydia. Very quickly to talk a bit about the doxypep story. So <clears throat> essentially doxycycline can be used as pre-exposure prophylaxis um, for bacterial SDIs and it can be used as a post-exposure prophylaxis for SDIs, about 24 to 72 hours, a bit like PEP. So there was some early data from 20, I think 17, where they saw the signal um, that, you know, doxycycline can have an impact on, on uh, STD rates among MSM. And Molina et al, you probably heard some of these uh, presentation, then showed this reduction in, in chlamydia and syphilis in, in the MSM cohorts, but no effect initially on, on gonorrhea. Uh, then Lutkemeyer presented this, I think, very recently, uh, the 65% reduction in quarterly STIs among people living with HIV and HIV negative, again in MSM and transgender. Um, that was published in the Union Journal. And then uh, Molina and the ANRS kind of developed this a little bit and added the Bexero vaccine. So they, they created this DOXIVAC uh, model, uh, which then interestingly also had an impact on gonorrhea. So it reduced the gonorrhea rate by 50%. Um, so I haven't seen the paper yet, but it may have just come out, I, I don't know. And then the, the unfortunate news uh, by the group from Kenya, did the study in Kenya among cisgender women that didn't show any impact on, uh, on uh, young women again. The usual story. Um, so we don't quite know, I think, at this stage why that happened, whether it's just the anatomy, whether it's adherence issues or potentially resistance. Um, yeah, so if we look at the uh, case for and against doxypep, which is probably the more likely way to go rather than doxyprep because it requires a lot more antibody use, uh, uh, antibiotic use. Is obviously it's effective in studies now in MSF populations. So I think in the US it's starting to be rolled up. Uh, doxycycline generally is well tolerated. If you have right, high rates of STIs among um, uh, persons on HIV prep, obviously that's a huge opportunity to to do an STD STI intervention. And I think again we discussed that already at this conference. Persons on HIV prep want access to doxypep now. I think. Um, the issues are, is it effective among cisgender women? We need a lot more data there. Uh, could it promote antimicrobial resistance? And I think the issue here is not just uh, doxycycline resistance of the STD organisms. It's actually multidrug resistance of common organisms like Staphylococcus and so on. Um, so I think uh, the teams are working on that, obviously, to do more detailed studies, and that will all be published soon. And then if bundled with HIV PrEP use, low use among heterosexual men and women may limit the potential impact. So again, what you went through with the oral PrEP, could this also become a problem with the, the doxypep? Uh, but it is being rolled out. I saw this uh, uh, Croy upstairs, I think, yeah. Um, and there seems to be quite high uptake in some settings in here in San Francisco in one of the clinics. So uh, there's definitely a demand for it. So I think I just stop here uh, and just summarize. So uh, again, we have unacceptably high burdens of SDIs and an urgent need for uh, low cost diagnostic care solutions in Southern Africa. We should drive the development of these point of care technology uh, solutions for faster, accurate and make them affordable. Uh, rapidly ev evaluate SDI vaccine products. I think we know how to do that nowadays. So we, we should just try to do it as quickly as possible. If effective against SDIs, these trials could potentially also have HIV incidence endpoints, maybe a secondary uh, endpoints. And then urgently assess reasons for doxypep limitations among cisgender women. 
and as always engage stakeholders and communities to re-energize the SDI research and uh, implement these solutions as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel, for that. I'm sure there will be lots of questions. Um, our next speaker is actually going to be virtual. It is um, Andrew Scheiber. He's a technical advisor for TB and HIV care and a researcher at the University of Pretoria's Department of Family Medicine, which is based in Hatfield, South Africa. His work focuses on the intersections between infectious diseases, determinants of health and rights, with a particular focus on substance use and harm reduction. So he's going to talk to us about substance use in the African region. Thank you. pleasure, to manage pain, to address trauma. Some people use it to assist with work, maybe mental health challenges, physical issues. And also it enables some people have connections with the community. And there are quite complicated relationships between substance use and health. We know that sometimes substances can contribute to illness, but also illness
And what you'll see in the United Kingdom is particularly alcohol is responsible for the greatest amount of overall harm, mostly to society, but also to the individual. And when looking at the illicit drugs, heroin is the second most uh, causative of harm, um, where it is slightly more to the individual than to harm to others. While we don't have similar rankings in the African context, we know that many of these things would, would be true, and particularly in South Africa, where I come from, this is an important issue, and this ranking would be fairly similar. Why also should we be focusing on illicit drugs, at least from a health perspective, is that we need to first acknowledge that alcohol use is widespread, particularly in certain parts of the continent, and alcohol is responsible for a range of, of health issues and also elevated risks for HIV, also influences on linkage to care and persistence in care. But when we look at those drugs that are illicit, uh, we must recognize that there are a lot of other aspects that contribute to elevated risk. And I've drawn up a section of the framework from the key population guidelines from WHO, which quite well highlights why some populations are at particular risk for HIV. And while this comes from key populations more generally, it relates specifically to people who use illicit drugs. You'll see because there's so much stigma related to drug use that contributes to a range of violence, exclusion, um, unemployment, poverty that people face. And there's also this link of how criminalization then furthers people's stigma and discrimination. And there's often an aspect of uh, gender disparity as well as racial inequality. And while it is important to note that these things might occur to people who, who use cannabis, we did mention earlier that cannabis is the most widely used illicit drug. Uh, in some countries, it has been decriminalized, for example, in South Africa for personal use, but it has less intrinsic risk to individuals and self, um, particularly when you're focusing on HIV and bloodborne infection. So now looking at those drugs that are responsible for more harms to individuals and self, that includes the stimulants looking at methamphetamine, uh, the amphetamine type stimulants, and also cocaine, and then the group of opioids. And we know that Africa is very much central or part of global trafficking routes, particularly those that follow where, from producer countries towards drug markets. You'll see that in the bottom right corner, an example of the heroin trafficking routes where most of the heroin comes from South and Eastern Asia, and it is travels en route to the European markets, and it passes through the east coast of Africa, and it travels across land, across um, through air. And we now know from more recent data on the left, which shows some of the important issues from the most recent drug, well, drug report from the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, that there are these local trafficking and markets, as well as local use of heroin in, in the east coast of Africa, as well as in southern Africa. When you look at the western part of Africa, we'll, we know that that is along the major cocaine trafficking route from South America, with a lot of the drugs trafficking across uh, the Sahara or via air. And also in the northern parts of Africa, there are markets of the illicit use of opioids, pharmaceutical opioids like tramadol. So depending on the context and the drug market and the drug flows and people's preferences, the kinds of drugs that people are using and the ways that they're using vary quite substantially. These are just some examples uh, taken from South Africa to of, of drugs. You'll see the top left, we've got an example of crack cocaine, which is just cocaine that's been formulated in a way that it forms into a crystal. It's more commonly available in South Africa than powder cocaine and more less expensive. Uh, the top right, you'll see an example of crystal methamphetamine. We know that South Africa, uh, as well as Nigeria, have got some methamphetamine labs. There's also lots of methamphetamine that is produced in uh, Southeast Asia and travels toward the European markets. And in the bottom uh, two pictures, you will see those are different examples of heroin, the way that they're sold in South Africa. Uh, and they will be similar in other parts of the country, of the continent. Uh, they're named, known by a name, a range of reasons, just for clarity, 
uh, Nyalpe, Wonga, Unga, Sugars, those are some local terms. And there have been some myths that we've had this unique substance of that we called Wonga or Wonga that was mostly antiretroviral therapy, uh, ART, but it's been confirmed with uh, spectrometry that the major pharmaceutical agent is our opioids and occasionally there's some paracetamol or caffeine. So why is drug use important in South Africa, in, in Africa? And it's largely related to the fact that there's a lot of social um, economic problems. We have a lot of unemployment. There's large degrees of socioeconomic inequality. There's conflict, there's unrest. In some places, there are poor governance structures. But also, we've got this young and expanding population. And as a result, the predicted number of people who will use drugs in the next uh, 30 years or so is expected to increase significantly. And associated with that, we know that not all drug use is harmful use, but a proportion of people will go on to develop um, dependency or drug use uh, conditions. And also if people continue and start injecting, there are a range of risks with those if people don't have access to sterile injecting equipment. The Epidemiological data from the African region is poor. This is some data pulled from a systematic review and meta-analysis by Degenart et al. And from the various maps that are taken from that publication, you can see all the gray zones where there is very little or no data available. And this is for people who inject drugs and for HIV. And you will see that it ranges quite a lot across the continent with the difference fairly similarly to the general population. So you'll see in South Africa and East Africa, uh, more than uh, 10 to 10 to 20% of people with HIV, which can be similar to this idea of we've got these concentrated epidemics of people who inject drugs uh, in these countries. We know in South Africa that there are um, different pockets and lots of injecting is taking place. In terms of the numbers of people who inject drugs, the estimates are are quite varied, and you can see from the amounts of countries that don't have data that it really is a is a very vague estimate, and it could be anywhere between sixty one thousand to two hundred and forty four thousand. From the same systematic review, a review of hepatitis C prevalence. Uh, this is data where there has been of HCV confirmed infection through uh, some kind of molecular testing, and you will see that the prevalence is higher than in the the HIV as a as a pooled estimate across the, the region with approximately 15% of people who inject drugs living with hepatitis C. We do know that this varies by country, and you'll see that in many countries where there is data, uh, you know, up to 40 or over 40% are living with hepatitis C, with almost 200,000 people who inject drugs suspected to be living with hepatitis C in the continent. In terms of hepatitis B, uh, in our region, it's an endemic condition, uh, more, usually more common, but in relevant to hepatitis C, it's slightly less, uh, with a confidence range of 4.1 to 10.5%, and perhaps around 86,000 people who inject drugs with hepatitis B are living. From that meta-analysis, also data which gave in insights into the kinds of drugs people are injecting in the African context, Overwhelmingly, it's, it's heroin, but there is also stimulant injecting. We know from our context in South Africa, for example, where there is uh, either methamphetamine or crack cocaine injecting, either alone or in combination with heroin. And across the continent, from where the data, the studies that have been available, about 51% reported to inject frequently, uh, with quite high levels of recent um, re re receptive needle syringe sharing being the last 12 months and many people engaging in sex work. There's very little data on overdose available. And I just know from some of the work that we've done locally, from a small pilot study done with people in three cities where there was um, harm reduction programs in, in operation to engage with people and found that you know majority of people uh, had used lots of drugs and had either known people who had died or themselves who had experienced overdose and very low levels of awareness of naloxone to manage opioid overdose. 
So in light of the social and economic problems in Africa, and particularly in Southern and Eastern Africa with the high HIV background prevalence, we know that addressing drug use is important, but also there are some nuances that we have to take into consideration, particularly those relating to women. We know that women who use and inject drugs are subject to even greater levels of stigma uh, because there are often these expected gender roles of women have household responsibilities, aren't expected to use drugs, and are often excluded. Uh, there are often very rarely services that cater to the particular needs of women, and also because many women go through uh, pregnancy and childbirth and, and also mothers, and also some of the specific issues affecting young people. We know that very few uh, services tailored to young people um, take a harm reduction approach. They're almost always abstinence-based. Uh, they often aren't supportive. Children who use um, drugs are often excluded from school. Uh, many of them enter into the criminal justice system or into gangs. There's also high levels of, of violence that affect people who use drugs and also significant stigma discrimination and the overwhelming likelihood of entering to the criminal justice system, which also increases exposure to a range of risks, uh, mental health traumas, but also tuberculosis. And because of the, the, the high levels of engagement with sex work and the particularly needs of women who use drugs, there's an important consideration of sexual and reproductive health. There are also these syndemics that occur among people who use drugs, the high risk of mortality. Many people have experienced a range of traumas and the mental health conditions that they face often uh, need to be taken into consideration. What's often um, neglected or not taken into consideration among people who inject drugs are the range of soft tissue injuries that include local infections, abscesses, but more importantly, uh, things that relate to resultant amputations, uh, infective endocarditis, uh, and bone and other infections. So just a, a note on harm reduction. I think some people, hopefully all people have heard of harm reduction, but just to reiterate that it's a principle and approach that really tries to minimize the negative health, social, and legal impacts associated with drug use policies and laws. And it's this idea that it's grounded in justice and human rights. And the way that it's intervened, inter integrated allows for judgment without coercion or discrimination and is really an important approach for HIV responses. And when sometimes pe people encounter resistance against harm reduction, it's very important to remember that there are many principles that align with medical ethics, particularly the the concept of doing good, uh, of focusing on harms and not inflicting harm, to provide people with a range of options, to help people where they're at, to involve people in their own healthcare decision making, and really to have a pragmatic approach to people's most immediate goals. So despite the overwhelming evidence and need for harm reduction, we know in Africa the coverage at least of two of the interventions that are most important for people who inject drugs are poor. And you'll see just from those areas in terms of needle and syringe services, less than half of the countries have them and none in Africa have needle and syringe services in prison settings. And in relation to opiate agonist therapy, even fewer countries have OAT and those that do exist, uh, there are only a handful where it's available in prison settings. So just in conclusion, like to reiterate that drug use is an important issue uh, in, in Africa, alcohol, as well as illicit drugs. And because of the specific harms and health issues related to illicit drugs, really following the, the UNAIDS recommendation and the UN agencies around the decriminalization of drugs for personal use and possession of small quantities for personal use is critical. It's also important that the health and social service needs of people who use drugs are taken into consideration and that there are services that are tailored to the needs for women, also young people. We need to be very aware as researchers in the field of, of HIV prevention that not only HIV is important, but also viral hepatitis, hepatitis C and hepatitis B. And we need to keep people alive and overdoses are important aspects. And so, we need greater research into how to increase access to these core life-saving interventions, needle and syringe services, 
opioid agonist therapy, uh, naloxone for, opio for nalo opioid overdose management, uh, and also access to psychosocial and behavioral interventions for people who want them. There are a range of research gaps. We're missing some surveillance data. We don't have good insight into trends. We also would benefit on better insight into model of integration, particularly into mainstream services of screening and intervention um, and access to harm reduction services, and really specific prevention options that meet the needs of people who use and inject drugs in the African context. Thank you and wishing you a fantastic meeting. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the organizations and partners that I work with and specifically some of the people that provided me with images. Anyway, I believe Andrew is going to be available online to answer questions. So questions on that topic are also welcome. Um, our next speaker, Dr. Sinead Delaney Moretli, needs no introduction to this group. Um, you're, she's well known to you, so I'm not going to tell you how famous she is. Thanks, Deborah, very much for that kind introduction. But once again, it's lovely to see you all uh, here in this in this space. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about um, the why we need to include pregnant and lactating people in research. And I hope that at the end of this talk, I'll have persuaded you that uh, you know people in our region, in particular, who have reproductive potential, have overlapping risks for both HIV and pregnancy but often are excluded from effective HIV prevention options. Uh, and then I want to explain why that's the case, but also why people have started to think about this differently. And then I think, you know, kind of what I really want us to think about is how the HPTN can engage in this, but also kind of the opportunities we already have to kind of really, I think, articulate a way forward um, and uh, what we need to do, I think, to also encourage communities to see uh, that uh, populations can be protected through research rather than uh, at risk. Uh, so, um, as you all know, uh, women have an unmet need for HIV prevention, particularly in our part of the world. About two thirds of women uh, or two thirds of people with HIV are, are women. Uh, and we know that adolescent girls have some of the highest rates of uh, infection in our region. You can overlay that with the fact that uh, total fertility rates have declined across the world, but continue to be high in the African region with women uh, on average having a about 4.6 births per woman in the African region. And that as many as half of these pregnancies may in fact be unintended in partly due to poor access to a range of contraception options such that uh, there may be as many as 145 per thousand unintended pregnancies per women on the African continent. We also have some evidence that pregnancy itself may increase the risk for HIV infection, particularly in the second and third trimesters. And this is probably due to a range of biological changes uh, that occur uh, in the female genital tract that essentially allow a woman's body to tolerate having a foreign body that is a fetus <laughs> on board. Uh, but also we know that you know, pregnancy is a time where behaviors change and it's the behaviors of women, but also of their partners that may put them at risk for HIV infection. The other thing to point out is the recent data from um, UNAIDS uh, really looking at why we are saying we are unable to kind of reach some of our elimination goals uh, for uh, pediatric infections. And one of the, the big reasons, reasons is in fact acquisition during the postpartum period through uh, breastfeeding where about 15% of pediatric infections are associated with uh, acquisition of HIV during the breastfeeding period because the mother has become uh, newly infected with HIV. And it's this, for this reason that WHO has made specific recommendations about uh, providing pre-exposure prophylaxis to uh, women uh, during uh, pregnancy and breastfeeding. 
So why is it that we're in a situation where despite these risks for women, they often do not have access to drugs during the pregnancy and postpartum period? And this is really born out of a concern uh, and a recognition that drugs used in the early postpart, uh, the early uh, pregnancy period may uh, lead to changes uh, in the development of the fetus. So the period sort of before uh, with within the first 10 weeks of gestation is uh, associated with a lot of um, development and the development of kind of very sensitive structures, including, for example, the nervous system. Uh, and it's for this reason that there are concerns about uh, the potential effects of drugs on the fetal development. In addition, some drugs may have indirect effects because of their influence on metabolic pathways. Uh, and our greatest experience uh, of and a, and a searing experience has in fact been the use of thalidomide during pregnancy as an anti-nausea agent, which, which led to very substantial uh, malformations of infants and children. And really as a consequence of that experience, we have landed in the situation where women of childbearing potential are often underrepresented in trials and where they are enrolled in trials, they are required to use an effective method of contraception. And if they become pregnant, they're required to stop the agent uh, that is the investigational product. But the consequence of this approach has really led to excluding uh, women from access to effective medications, essentially kicking the can down the road. And in the figure, what you can see is the approval of some antiretroviral drugs, but that it took on average about six years to get specific approvals for pregnant and lactating people. And the consequence of this is that, you know, kind of pregnant women often then get access to these drugs uh, off-label, they may be given at the wrong dose because we don't have data on uh, sort of pharmacology in pregnancy. They may be given drugs that have an unacceptable risk because we've not measured the kind of safety profile of these drugs during pregnancy. And they may be denied access to critical drugs. And in South Africa, we have examples of that where we cannot get uh, a use of particular drugs in pregnant and breastfeeding women, essentially because they were excluded from the trials. So a number of stakeholders have recognized that in fact, this is creating a bigger problem for ourselves and that maybe we need to think about it differently in terms of how we include pregnant and lactating people in trials. And uh, some work done by the phases group, I think really catalyzed a number of conversations and encouraged us to think about this problem differently. So instead of thinking about pregnant and lactating people as a population that need to be protected from research that in fact uh, they are not a vulnerable population but a complex population. They need protection through research, in fact. Uh, and that, you know, kind of by excluding them, we should rather think about that it's it's more equitable to include them and to also recognize that people can make uh, informed decisions about whether or not to participate in research. So WHO and IMPACT in the last two years worked with a group of experts across the world to really consider what would make it possible to take this ambition of inclusion uh, and make it actionable in a way that also addressed people's concerns about safety. And they came up with a set of key principles which were published in a supplement of the Journal of the International AIDS Society articulating an approach that we can all use to think about how to include pregnant and lactating people, particularly in trials of new HIV drugs. And essentially the idea is if the drug is effective in non-pregnant populations and we can achieve adequate drug concentrations in a, in a pregnant population, we can assume that we have efficacy and we don't need to do efficacy trials in pregnant populations. Similarly for vertical transmission, if we've demonstrated it in an, a non-pregnant population, we can assume, and, and drug concentrations are similar, we can assume prevention of vertical transmission. But what we do need and what is critical is pharmacokinetic data so that we can understand optimal dosing during pregnancy because uh, pregnancy really changes how we metabolize drugs. Uh, it is desirable really to have safety studies that can articulate the potential safety concerns both during pregnancy, but also kind of for the infant and also for the mother. Um, and that these should be conducted, uh, particularly when we know these drugs are going to be used broadly like PrEP agents. 
that we also know what trials can't do. They really can't detect rare adverse events like uh, congenital malformations. And that so we also need to build an infrastructure that can conduct surveillance well past the time that the trials are done. And this is a particular challenge for us in the African region. We don't have good pharmacovigilance systems. And it's something that a lot of people are now paying attention to as we introduce a number of, of products. Um, and so ideally what we want when products are introduced into programs is some data on dosing, but also short-term safety, that it's equivalent to what we would see in a non-pregnant population uh, so that there are no restrictions to use. Uh, depending on pregnancy status. And so what does that mean for how we conduct research? Well, in the past, if you look along the sort of top part of the diagram, you can see not included, not included, not included. Uh, and then sort of at phase four, then maybe some uh, studies in pregnant uh, participants. But the alternative approach is basically to ensure that drug developers do the reproductive uh, toxicology and the pre and postnatal development studies early on in the development process, ideally sort of after phase one, but definitely sort of at the time of phase two studies, which would then allow potentially for the inclusion of, of pregnant populations in these phase two or late phase studies, uh, and would allow us also to kind of collect um, uh, safety and dosing data in, po uh, in populations who become pregnant during the trial, but possibly even allow them to enroll in the trial. Uh, and then um, importantly for drugs that are gonna have widespread use to ensure that we have sufficient data, uh, safety data in a pregnant population uh, and to make sure that there is some process for uh, surveillance in post-trial marketing. And just to say that this process really has taken place in the last two years, but it's been striking uh, that we now see many of the PrEP trials uh, recognizing the need to in include pregnant and lactating people. And so the uh, trials of Cabotogravir, Lenacapavir, and the uh, Zatravir trial, which did not progress, all made provision for the inclusion of these populations. So to reflect back on this concern about congenital malformations, just to say that in fact, in pregnancy, probably congenital anomalies are not the only safety concern related to medications. And in fact, they're probably the tip of the iceberg. What we really need to be more worried about are outcomes that are often fairly common in our region, absent of medications, but predict kind of the long-term success of the infant. So preterm delivery, low birth weight, small for gestational age and fetal loss are really important outcomes. Uh, and there may also be important out outcomes for the, for the mother um, that need to be considered. One of the challenges we've had in the African region is that we really don't have background rates. So, uh, you know, kind of you can do studies and see uh, outcomes, for example, around pregnancy loss, but maybe those outcomes, although high, are equivalent to what we would see absent a drug. So this is some work done by colleagues at the MTN where they did a chart review in, in a number of major sort of obstetric units in hospitals in several countries, really looking at uh, pregnancy outcomes in, absent of sort of drug uh, interventions or unlicensed drug interventions. And although the text is very small, I just wanted to point out sort of the much higher prevalence of, of an outcome like preterm birth, so sort of 10 to 15 percent versus kind of a rare event like a congenital anomaly. Uh, and to make the point that, um, that these outcomes are probably more important uh, in terms of health, particularly in low and middle income countries. So just to say the outcome of preterm birth or low birth weight, are preterm birth is, is one of the leading causes of death uh, among children in under fives, where about a third of deaths in neonates are associated with preterm birth. And preterm neonates who survive are going to have both short and long-term consequences for their health. And those uh, outcomes are gonna have significant costs both to the health system, but also to families who have to care for those, those infants. And similarly with low birth weight. So in fact, these are the outcomes we probably should be paying attention to when we are evaluating new, new uh, HIV prevention products. So there is now a call really to try to um, uh, 
harmonize a set of a, uh, safety outcomes that can be assessed across a range of trials. This is work being uh, shepherded to some extent by the WHO Pregnancy and Therapeutics Working Group to agree on a set of harmonized outcomes by which we can measure the safety of new products, both in trials, but also in, in surveillance. And the, the items highlighted in red are the things that are considered the minimal data set with the other items considered sort of more expansive. So for the HPTN, I think it means adopting these st uh, standardized and harmonized outcomes and including them in all our studies so that we can begin to kind of measure uh, this uh, in, in pregnant populations. Another important point I wanted to call out, and it goes back to this point about what we know about background rates, is that as we start to kind of do these studies, it's going to be incredibly important that we have a contemporaneous comparator group. Uh, and that's because, you know, kind of you can, again, do studies where you show high rates of an outcome. But if you don't have a comparison, you don't know, you know, kind of is this a true uh, um, concern or is this, in fact, kind of just corresponding to what happens to women who are pregnant in our part of the world? And background rates are not ideal. So I think, you know, another opportunity for the HPTN is to begin to uh, sort of compile databases that allow us to sort of have a comparison group, but perhaps also to adapt some of the approaches we've developed for estimating placebo incidence and to think about that in terms of assessing safety of products in, in, in placebo arms. So now I want to switch to our favorite study, HPTN 084. <laughs> Uh, not everyone's favorite study, my favorite study. <laughs> and just to say that 084 has presented us with a wonderful opportunity to really action some of these ideas and to, to translate them uh, into um, opportunities to really ensure that as Cabotegravir is introduced into programs in our region, we are able to provide those programs with the data they need to reassure, as Saika showed you, the thousands of women, many of whom may become pregnant, that there are not going to be significant excess harms to their infant. And so in 084, the key questions we're asking are what are the maternal pregnancy and infant safety outcomes uh, between people who've received CAB versus those who have not? And this we're asking in the open label extension. But also, do we need to do dose adjustments of cabotegravir during pregnancy? And while we don't think that this is necessary, while we don't think that that's the case, it's important to have that data. And then what can we say about infant exposure to CAB during lactation? Because some women have chosen not to take CAB during their pregnancy, but they are very keen to, to restart CAB once they have delivered. And we know virtually nothing about cabotegravir in breast milk. Although again, the data that we have is very reassuring. Also just to say that I think many communities in our region were traumatized by the dolutegravir experience and the kind of the, the message about neural tube defects. And it's been really reassuring to see that that concern has been addressed through accumulating data. Um, but given that it was really important when we started to do the work in 084 around pregnancy and lactation, that we bring communities along with us because it's really important that that they provide the necessary support to participants in studies. And so we did a community consultation, and I think it was very informative for us for re reminding us that the greatest concern that people have is about safety, and that they are really telling us as researchers, you have to provide us with the information that is kind of available to you, but also that people's concerns are, you know, kind of vary, you know, people are more concerned during pregnancy, less concerned uh, during lactation. Finally, just to kind of make the point that um, participants are now allowed to choose to um, have CAB injections during pregnancy, uh, and they are followed up through to one year postpartum themselves and their infant. As of April of this year, we had had 268 pregnancies in the open label extension, 160 of those people actually consented to the sub study so three more than three quarters, um, and many of them are using um, uh, are actively dosing with cabotegravir. So we are really looking forward to being able to report out the important results of, about dosing uh, and dose adjustment during pregnancy in the, in the coming year. 
So really just to conclude that I hope that you will agree with me that women in our region need uh, effective prevention agents that can protect them during pregnancy and lactation, that it really uh, is um, important for us as researchers to recognize that we can protect people who become pregnant better with research rather than by excluding them from research. And really as the HPTN, we have an opportunity to contribute to the evidence, uh, to uh, engage with communities about why this is important and to uh, build the evidence base, both for Cabotegravir, but all the future products we evaluate. And just to acknowledge all the people uh, who contributed to this, but also to all of you who actually have done the very hard work to enroll all these participants into these trials. So thank you very much. So our fourth, thank you, Sinead. <laughs> our fourth speaker today is Dr. Ken Mayer. And I think Doc, uh, Ken is one of our, um, physicians, um, he works at, he's employed at um, Harvard Medical School, but he's one of the physicians that you see working in every network. Um, Ken is, is, uh, is an expert in the MTN and he's in the HVTN and we're lucky enough to have his contribution in the PTN. Um, he also is, has, is now engaged with the ATN. Um, he's going to talk to us today about HIV prevention for gender diverse populations. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Deborah. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be um, here with you today in Cape Town. So the key takeaways from my talk about uh, HIV prevention for transgender and gender diverse populations are that for transgender women, uh, PrEP and HIV treatment are effective when adherent. So the challenge is uh, to have interventions that promote adherence. Less is known about transgender men and non-binary people. Uh, there's limited data on integrated biobehavioral interventions. So there's certainly a database on some behavioral interventions that we'll talk about. And we certainly know that the biological interventions work if uh, scaled up, but the integration of the two has not been adequately studied. Uh, there's need for status neutral interventions, uh, I'll try to make the case. And there's need to address some trans-specific drivers of HIV risk. Some of that may include structural interventions that promote resilience. So things like name change, training healthcare workers to provide culturally competent care, and perhaps consideration of economic interventions such as conditional cash transfer or skills building. And these tailored interventions need to engage the community. So nothing about us without us is the important message. So just a few definitional points. Sex and gender are different. And uh, for people who haven't been thinking about this for a long time, it sometimes gets confusing. Uh, one of my colleagues said the easy way to think about this is Sex is between the legs and gender is between the ears. Um, it's much more complicated than that, but it's very important to think about se sex is something assigned as birth uh, based on biology. It includes anatomy, uh, chromosomes, and hormones. Gender involves cultural uh, and social distinctions. Um, and it's routinely important to ask people about their assigned sex and their gender identity to have a full picture of a person's profile. Uh, when we talk about transgender, gender diverse uh, people, a uh, few of the important definitions to consider are cisgender means that the assigned sex at birth is congruent with the gender identity. Transgender individuals have a different gender identity or expression that's different than their sex assigned at birth. So we talk about transgender women, we can talk about transgender men, there are other terms. The technical terms would be uh, for a transgender woman would be male assigned at birth, but having a different gender identity. Trans men would be the opposite. Um, and then there are non-binary individuals. And this is a definition that's, uh, that people will apply to themselves that's increasingly common, at least in the United States, in Europe, but certainly growing. And I've talked to colleagues here in Africa about there are certainly individuals who identify as non-binary. The important thing to understand is, uh, although our discussion about transgender individuals may be more recent, um, there are cultural norms in many societies uh, for transgender individuals uh, throughout um, society. So you can see some of the terms in different cultures. Uh, I've done a lot of work in India, for example, and hijra is a very common known term um, uh, in many countries, uh, countries like uh, Pakistan and Iran, 
uh, there can be a third sex that a person can identify with uh, on a passport, but it's really a gender, but, but the idea that there actually is a, allowing for that in societies that one thinks of as more traditional uh, just speaks to the fact that um, transgender people have been with us throughout society. We're just recognizing their existence, particularly in the context of HIV infection because of the increased vulnerability to HIV. And then lastly, in terms of the definitions, in terms of non-binary people, these are individuals who don't in endorse either of the binaries, either identifying as male or female. Um, and this categorization has increased in time um, in, the, in, in the US and in other cultures. There are other terms that people apply to that, gender queer, gender fluid, gender expansive, agender, pangender. The important thing is, again, if one asks about um, sexual orientation, gender identity, one can get a full picture of a person's potential risk for HIV. When we talk about HIV, a uh, very recent meta-analysis really pulled together um, a lot of the world's literature, 98 studies uh, for the last 20 plus years. Uh, this study um, analyzed data from almost 50,000 trans-feminine individuals from 34 countries. And when uh, separated by the different regions of the world, if you look at the fact that there were nine countries in Africa where there are data uh, from, the sample size was reasonably large, over a thousand individuals, and HIV prevalence overall was almost 30%. And if you do the odds ratio, uh, it's 20 over 20 fold increase odds ratio compared to general population demographically matched uh, sample. Uh, this is a bit lower than some of the other uh, countries in terms of the relative uh, risk, but that's because the um, HIV prevalence in the general population is much higher in Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, but it certainly speaks to the fact that there's a disproportionate HIV burden among African transgender individuals. Uh, uh, additional data looking at MSM studies, so a different way of looking at the question. So taking studies that recruited men who have sex with men uh, using techniques like respondent-driven sampling uh, found, again, that about 20% of the sample when recruiting uh, men, in this case, males assigned at birth, 20% identified as a transgender women, uh, a woman. And when, when the transgender women were compared to the cisgender men in the sample, um, HIV prevalence overall was 25% among the transgender women, was 14% among the men who have sex with men. And when you look at the... Um, differences, uh, transgender in individuals were um, had an odds ratio of almost twofold higher uh, than the um, cisgender men in terms of HIV prevalence. Uh, condomless sex was more common, depression was more common, interpersonal stigma was more common, law enforcement related stigma was more common, violence, and um, uh, all these things speak to an increasingly dense uh, epidemic among transgender women. And then lastly, another very important data source was a study conducted uh, through the HPTN, HPTN 075. This enrolled 401 uh, participants in Blantyre, Cape Town, Kisumu, and Soweto. 20% of the individuals enrolled identified as transgender women, transsexual, female, or male plus female. One of the challenges in terms of analyzing the data was that in the various study visits, um, some individuals changed how they answered these questions. So a certain amount of gender fluidity and perhaps a certain amount of, of, of difficulty of the participants in sort of conceptualizing how to respond with the way that we ask the questions. But once again, HIV uh, incidence uh, in this case was extremely high, uh, higher for the transgender women than for the cisgender men. The difference was not statistically significant, but that's because the number of transgender women was relatively small, was about 100 individuals. But overall in the sample, there was high prevalence of transactional sex, high prevalence of forced sex. Um, over half the individuals uh, talked about sex under the influence of alcohol or drugs, high prevalence of rectal STIs, and only among the individuals who are HIV infected, um, only a little more than a quarter were virologically suppressed and stigma and healthcare discrimination were common. And then when we compare the transgender individuals with the men who have sex with men in the study, you can see um, gender non-conforming individuals were more likely to report being sexually abused, having forced sex, engaged in transactional sex, receptive anal intercourse, being HIV infected, uh, exclusively attracted to men, and experiencing homophobia. So uh, again, speaking to a disproportionate um, uh, 
risk for syndemic conditions among transgender individuals. There's much less known about transgender men, but there was a, a meta-analysis that was conducted with almost 100 studies. And once again, HIV prevalence was high. And when transmasculine individuals was, were compared to all adults in the same populations, the odds ratio for HIV was uh, almost sevenfold uh, greater. Uh, there are no studies on trans men that I could find that reported on HIV incidents, uh, but lots of studies reported um, high-risk sexual behaviors. Among non-binary people, there's even less information in terms of the epidemiology. Uh, the only large data sources from the United States, there was a, a, a national uh, online study, uh, 27,715 uh, participants. Uh, of those individuals, uh, this was overall looking at individuals who did not identify as cisgender, about a third of the individuals identified as non-binary. Um, HIV prevalence among males assigned uh, sex at birth was 1%. It was 0.2% among females assigned sex at birth. These are much higher uh, rates than the general U.S. population. So again, suggesting an increased disproportionate burden of HIV risk, but much less is known about this population. So when we think about um, interventions around transgender health, we have to keep in mind that HIV and SDI are only one set of health conditions that affect transgender individuals. Uh, studies show poor uh, self-related general health, uh, behavioral health issues, uh, depression, substance use are certainly common. Uh, there are cancer-related risks that are disproportionate, such as higher rates of smoking, uh, cardiovascular disease risks uh, have not been well characterized, but some suggestion of increased risk. Certainly lots of literature suggesting violence and victimization, delays in preventive screening, lack of access to gender affirming care, and social um, stigma and economic exclusion are also issues. So if we're trying to develop holistic interventions, we have to keep in mind these other issues that are affecting transgender individuals. Uh, just looking at data from the United States with, again, another national uh, survey, finding just high prevalence of these issues, which uh, from my talks to African with African colleagues, we certainly think that these are not going to be uncommon issues in Africa as well. A third are re, um, responding that they were bullied in schools, family rejection, almost 50 percent, high levels of suicidality and attempted suicide, high levels of poverty, homelessness. Uh, discrimination in health care, uh, concerns about medical care, uh, being publicly harassed and sexually assaulted. And in the U.S., uh, we can't ignore the fact that transgender murders have doubled in the last year in the United States. And at a structural level, in uh, some of the states in the United States, um, some of the leaders, some of the governors have been um, um, floridly ant, um, anti-transgender in some of their public pronouncements, which does not uh, enhance engagement and care. Uh, and when we think about uh, interventions and, and approach to working with transgender individuals, we have to realize that gender non-affirmation has health co consequences. So this was a study in transmasculine individuals um, conducted by, by my colleague, Sarah Reisner, and over 75% re um, responded that they had experienced gender non-affirmation uh, with a um, substantial number reporting fairly high levels of non-affirmation. And the reason for us as an HIV prevention network, um, why this issue of gender affirmation is so important is that individuals who reported non-affirmation were more likely to be depressed, were more likely to be anxious, were more likely to engage in condomless sex, and to not be tested for HIV. So non-affirmation leads to non-engagement in care, makes it harder to have HIV successful HIV prevention outcomes. So what do we know about our interventions for transgender individuals? So the first uh, pre uh, PrEP study, the IPREC study, um, did have a population of transgender women enrolled in the study. About 14% of the participants uh, identified as transgender women. And unfortunately, the study did not show efficacy in transgender women. So people said, could this be the horm uh, gender-affirming hormones uh, affecting uh, the levels of uh, tenofovir and untricytabine? Well, it turned out that a post hoc analysis found that all individuals who had drug levels consistent with taking at least four pills a week uh, did have uh, effective prevention. And so there were no seroconversions in that setting. And then in point of fact, among um, the transgender individuals assigned uh, to the TDF-FTC arm uh, who seroconverted, they did not have drug levels suggesting that they were taking uh, the medication. So non-adherence was the issue and not uh, the pharmacology. And 
when the transgender women were compared to the MSM in the study, there was less consistent PrEP use. So it, adherence and non-engagement in the trial is the bigger issue than the pharmacology itself. Uh, there's been a lot written, including um, individuals here in this audience, such as Mark Morzinki, have done work looking at the interaction of gender-affirming hormones and um, on, uh, tenofovir and m And basically, uh, high levels of estrogens can, in some of the studies, uh, was shown to decrease levels of gender-affirming hormones, but the reverse is not true. Gender-affirming um, uh, hormones are not affected by the TDF F FTC. Uh, so that's a really important message because uh, uh, there's still a lot of misunderstanding and among some groups of transgender individuals thinking that by taking the hormones they might um, uh, and taking PrEP, they might be compromising uh, their gender affirmation. And that's definitely not the case. Uh, but the, the real problem with, in terms of PrEP uh, for transgender individuals is just the, the PrEP cascade and, and getting individuals to be aware of their HIV risk uh, to take PrEP. Uh, there, uh, in a study that we were involved in, uh, six sites in the United States uh, called the Light Cohorts Study, uh, led by Sarah Reisner and Andrea Wirtz at Johns Hopkins, six cities across the U.S. Uh, with a, a sample of over 1,200 uh, transgender women. Uh, everybody had to be sexually active to be in the study. Uh, the vast majority, over 80%, had heard about PrEP, but when you march through the cascade in terms of the um, percentage who actually were on PrEP recently, 20% and only 13% 30, uh, were adherent uh, to PrEP. Uh, PrEP use was associated with sex work, substance misuse, and being younger. But when we look at um, people's attitudes about why uh, they um, were, were not on PrEP, uh, high levels of not liking a daily pill, concerns about side effects, uh, concerns about being low risk for HIV. When we look at transgender men, uh, the most common reasons for not interest in PrEP are not perceiving HIV risk, costs, and side effects. Uh, what we do know is that medical gender affirming care improves quality of life and improves engagement in care and probably should be part of any hallmark of, of any kind of intervention that we plan. So one study that is underway now is HB10091, which is looking at the issue of gender affirming care um, uh, provided in, in context of PrEP. And the study has been very successful to date. Um, it's um, almost fully uh, enrolled uh, when it reaches completion date. Retention is over 90%. This is five cities across the U.S., and hopefully we'll be able to show that co-location of gender-affirming services uh, leads to better engagement in PrEP care. HP10083 also enrolled transgender women um, and showed uh, um, very clearly uh, that injectable cabotegravir uh, is, works quite well for um, uh, uh, transgender women uh, as well. And the other uh, sub-study in terms of um, uh, cabotegravir and gender-affirming hormones showed that the pharmacology, you can see the drug levels and in the um, individuals getting estrogens and those not um, was identical so that there's no effect of the hormones on uh, the um, cabotegravir as well. Uh, there are a number of evidence-based behavioral change interventions, that, but they haven't been brought to scale, which is a real, real challenge. So we have to think about how we integrate some of these behavioral interventions with some of the uh, interventions we have that are biological as well. So to wind down, it's very important for us as sites to think about how we create gender affirming environments for our patients. Things as, as simple as training the front desk to make sure that you don't misgender individuals when they come in uh, for services is important. There's a variety of guidances that have been written and uh, shameless plug, I've, um, our website at Fenway Health, we have Fenway Institute, uh, which does our research education and policy. And we have a variety of um, uh, tools uh, initially funded by the US government uh, to train providers, uh, webinars and other uh, kinds of tools. So if you feel that your site could benefit from further uh, education in this area, uh, there are tools available, certainly other tools besides the ones that we can provide. And then lastly, it is extremely important to obtain community perspectives, again, working with and not on transgender communities. Uh, in The Lancet several years ago, there was a special issue on transgender health um, and HIV. And they had uh, two commentary pieces by two wonderful African transgender activists uh, uh, suggesting that there's increasing recognition 
here um, on the continent uh, that uh, transgender individuals have different healthcare needs than cisgender, MSM, and other populations. And that's very important for us to form strategic alliances with these individuals uh, so that we can have effective community engagement and reach the populations who need the services. So with that, I want to thank you. I want to thank colleagues uh, for provision of slides and uh, look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken, for addressing that very important conversation. We have mics open on the left and on the right. I'll let people come up. Mike, let you have the first question. Is this working? Yes. Well, first, thanks, Alvin. That was really wonderfully informative and spectacular presentation. So thank all of you. Sinead, I have a really specific question for you. Um, and, and that is, uh, I think you made the point it really, really well, you know, that, that our surveillance of our adverse events in pregnancy is disaster-oriented and not magnitude-oriented. And so it, it emphasizing the idea that we convert Gestational diabetes, chronic and preeclampsia are common problems with disastrous outcomes, but that are overwhelmed by birth control denial results. I really believe the same. My question though really is: Are there examples of drugs? So, having emphasized the point, are there drugs that that are known to cause preterm birth? And this is an ignorant question. Maybe it's very common in, in, in obstetrics. You know, you can't get yeah. drug X because it evokes preterm birth. Is, is, are there examples of that? Or are we looking for a thing? Yeah, you see my question. Are there such drugs? Hey, uh, can you turn your mic on? Thank you. But to the obstetricians and gynecologists in the room to kind of answer that specific question sort of off the top of my head. I think the the point to make is that we already have a significant burden of preterm birth and low birth weight in our region. And what we don't want to do is use drugs that are going to increase that risk even further, even if those risks might be small. But in terms of absolute numbers, given the coverage of drug, that still will kind of increase the kind of overall risk. And I, I, I mean, to be honest, I think the point is we are, we, we have not, we don't have enough data in our part of the world to really be able to kind of um, comment on uh, sort of what sort of excess risks might be associated with certain products because we just haven't done the measurements. Let me ask you one question. You made the point, <coughs> I guess this is because you're the the lack of keratogenicity should not be reassuring in clinical. I think that's the point I'm making. Keratogenicity studies that FDA demands don't preclude what needs to be done with phase four surveillance of the But my question is, I'm not aware of the keratogenicity can really uh, often cause disastrous, you know, delays, you know, because you have one microphone in the family. Yeah, I think so. The example that colleagues use is valproate. So you can, like, truly teratogenic drugs, you will pick that up in the preclinical data. Uh, and you should not progress those drugs. And then most other drugs, we uh, could say that on average, there may be, you know, kind of, we can feel confident that we will find the truly bad drugs and then kind of any with those studies, but we cannot exclude that risk absolutely until post-marketing surveillance. But I think it's a, it's hugely reassuring to say we saw no obvious uh, toxicity and therefore can progress. And that's what so it, it's it's really to kind of reassure people that there are studies that you can do that can identify uh, obvious toxicities and stop progress, but also, you know, kind of you, you and allow things to progress. But, but in the end, the only way that you will truly exclude concerns is with post-marketing surveillance and that that should be done well, because we've had two drugs, two HIV drugs, efavirenz and dolutegravir 
have signals because of small studies that were reported, you know, kind of that led to potentially bigger consequences for many people. So we need to be much more sort of thoughtful and mindful and structured in the way that we collect that data and in the way that we kind of make comments on sort of what we do and don't know about the safety of drugs. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for all the questions. <laughs> I, I have a question for, uh, for Nigel, but I do want to answer Mike's question to some extent. There's a, there's a category system, you know, category A, it's safe, category B. I don't know the exact system, so it would be nice if one of the OBGYNs in the room can actually explain it because they know it better than I do. But, um, and for hepatitis C, there was once, there was a drug called Drivopirin, which was an antiviral, and that was a repository. So if you had a pregnancy, you would report that, and then they would, they would sort of follow up. So there was a data repository system. Um, my question is for Nigel. A lot of the, you know, disease approaches are sort of very siloed, you know, disease X, disease Y, you know, none of it is combined. Can you, when you talk about your SCI um, management, can you can you sort of sketch out your ideal comprehensive diagnostic approach where we truly have a one-stop shop approach where people come to the clinic and they leave because then you ran all the diagnostics you wanted to and you have sort of everything solved in that one visit. And then can we go to the diagnostics manufacturers and sort of make sure we, we get what we want? I think it's pretty clearly laid out by the WHO, but I think the reason I tried to, to take you through our story is a bit how we thought about it and how we're getting closer. You know, 90 minutes, we added microscopy because we think BV and candida are really important in our setting. So we do this on everyone, a microscopy, chlamydia gonorrhea testing, and the trichomoniasis. I think that covers most of it in the young women. Uh, you can do your syphilis testing, of course. Um, but we do all that within two hours, and most of our visits are about minimum two hours so in, in, in the studies. So I think that was great. Uh, in the real world, um, we need much faster assays. So, uh, so we did a study in our STD clinic in the Department of Health Clinic next door, um, and we tracked everyone. We did a time and motion study, and it looks like people spend four hours in the clinic and then seven minutes with a nurse doing syndromic management. If you added our model of care, it was still about, it was about four and a half hours, <laughs> but you, you obviously had a lot more done. So I think a lot of our care pathways are very inefficient in our current setting. And I, there are other people that know a lot more about this, but there's a lot we need to still change in terms of healthcare system. Thank you. And then with, with the diagnostic test, which test is your bottleneck in terms of time? Well, it is a gene expert because it's 90 minutes. Seven, 70 minutes and then obviously handling, specimen handling and so on adds some time. So, uh, but I'm, I know there are assays almost available now that can do this in 30 minutes. Okay, and they can actually tweak that because they some of their essays have a different system where they sort of look in real time and as soon as it is positive, it will blink and that's what they have done for the Ebola test, for instance. So we can we can talk to them. Yeah, you mean if you have a high bacterial burden or so it may light up quicker. That's a good good strategy. Thanks. I'd like to move on. Thank you. So uh, I'd like to thank all four speakers for really incredible thought provoking presentations. I know um, I benefit so much from just hearing experts in all of these fields and views on these topics. Um, it's really thought provoking and, and, and really helpful. Thank you. Um, Nigel, I don't mean to pick on you, uh, uh, but I have a specific question about doxypep and your thoughts and the African context. Janelle Stewart presented at ISTDR this past summer, some provocative hair data that suggested that the reason for the negative result in the Kenya DPAP study was, in fact, most likely non adherence. I'm sure you saw those data. And, you know, it, it begs the question of some of the same questions we're asking about oral pre exposure prophylaxis and cisgender women in, in the region that it's not sexual, congruent with, with the sexual life, lives and desires of individuals in, in the region. Could you sort of wax poetic a little bit about your thoughts about uh, a doxy strategy is having the same challenges and 
whether a prep or and you know uh, more regularly administered uh, weekly or something like that strategy might be of interest to study um and and also these questions of the mechanism of resistance of doxycycline particularly with related to gonorrhea and whether you personally are concerned about whether eventually or if this is rolled out as part of public programs we're going to have 100 percent gonorrhea resistance thanks so much i think you you're obviously touching on the on the big question and we're all concerned about that but maybe you as prep uh scientist you know much more about oral medication in 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 cisgender young women so you know adherence is a, is an issue we know that and that's why you're sitting at the carbotegravir table um <laughs> we we discussed this a little bit yesterday i think you know what kind of intervention could we build around doxy pep or prep or whatever it is and I mean, I see it more as two different strands of research. You know, one there's the implementation research, which includes much better testing modalities in our trials, which I think we can do today. You know, we don't need to wait to add SDI testing and efficient systems for, for young women in our PrEP programs. And then I think the longer term, I think we should get more involved in the, the vaccine field because, you know, that is the ultimate long acting, hopefully, solution. Uh, um, yeah, whether there are long-acting STI treatment options, obviously that's, uh, uh, I think, an unanswered question. I don't actually know of any agents that can, you know, have a PK level long enough to to maybe be an additive to, to carbotegravir, for example. Maybe we should look into that more and uh, and see whether any of the companies have developed any of those antibiotics. Thank you, Nigel. The tools Thanks. we have versus the tools we need to have. Um, Miru, I think you will be our last question before the panel. Thanks. And thank you all. Thank all the speakers. I'd like to also say what a great session we've had. My question is to Andrew. And also thank you, Andrew, for joining remotely uh, from where you are. I didn't hear you say anything about fentanyl use. And uh, could you kind of uh, highlight how bad or good it is? And it's a big issue in the United States and any other trends that you see in research, particularly with respect to substance use? Thank you. So fortunately, the potent synthetic opioids haven't made a big footprint in the African market that we're aware of. I'm currently in Nigeria and we're actually doing some training around uh, opioid agonist therapy and in the Nigerian market, there's a lot of um, pharmaceutical opioids that are used, and pentacid is a new uh, opioid that I wasn't familiar with that's used and injected, um, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of tramadol, uh, excuse me, uh, fentanyl use. And I think what we need to have is better surveillance systems, uh, and those are informal with people who use drugs to get a sense of as things change so that we can we can act. Fortunately, the can I say the trends that have contributed to the fentanyl use in, in North America have not really been applicable in the African context. So the, the, the majority of, of opioids, at least that are traveling in the East Coast and through Southern Africa are, are mostly heroin. Uh, and in West and Northern Africa, as I mentioned, is mostly the pharmaceutical opioids, but still there is increasing use, use of heroin. So we have to be, we're very um, ill-equipped to deal with a fentanyl um, epidemic. If it does come to our shores, naloxone is very rarely available, uh, even in primary care settings. And there are very few, if any countries that have community distribution uh, and even less that have it available by first responders. So just overall, we need to be better equipped to how to raise awareness and have access to easy, easily uh, provided um, naloxone, so either through nasal sprays or have the, the policy landscape uh, allow lab providers to administer naloxone through injections. I think that's really a key thing so that if fentanyl use does increase, that we're able to respond more effectively. And I think it would be like the discussion around uh, including more um, pregnant people in, in our studies. We have to better include people with, uh, with a range of uh, drug use disorders 
in our research because they're at, at high risk. And I think that uh, is an important thing that we have to try and understand and better integrate uh, evidence-based treatment into our, our trials and not have substance use disorders as exclusion criteria, because that's the reality. Many of the people who need services uh, often have substance use issues that aren't well controlled. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's going to conclude the question and answer session. And we're now switching out for a very, uh, very important or, and probably exciting um, panel discussion. So we're going to switch out and so thank everybody. Thank your speakers. That's <laughs> good <laughs> Not, not that I don't want to. I don't want to uh, spoil your conviviality, but I must. So let me, let me get let me get y'all. Okay, so we're going to do something different. We're going to do something different as an experiment. Uh, all right, thank you, Nero. Boy, so uh, I'm Mike Cohen, and we're going to try something a little bit different, which I hope works out well. Um, we talked a lot about like informative about where we are. We're trying to, the whole point of this meeting is where do we go next? But in that context, we've tried to put together people in the region who have responsibility for policies and are always thinking about what's next, how to use resources. And so it's, we ought to have a pretty exciting panel of hearing the opinions. And, and this is not gonna be like slides. This will be like an opinion and representative probably of your individual organizations. And then we'll have a, a discussion uh, with our panelists and from the audience about these are good ideas, bad ideas, or why don't you do this, or why don't you do that? So let me introduce our panelists. John Blanford, who I've known a long time, is from the CDC, but he's country director for South Africa, so welcome. Grace Kumwenda is from, I, I'm sure, from Malawi, <laughs> and um, is working with AVAC in Malawi, an organization we're all very familiar with. Um, Liesl Page Ship, who's at the end, is the senior program manager for the Gates Foundation. Uh, in the region, I gather, and so welcome. And last but not least, we have Asina Sudaba, um, who is actually Senior Technical Advisor with the South Africa National Department of Health, which actually, you have the most authority. And, and <laughs> so we look at you, everybody else has an opinion, you actually have power. <laughs> and you know, it can be exercised even as we're speaking. So I think that the goal, I think you've been asked to speak for a few minutes about what you think. And, and the, the, the primary question was, okay, how do we achieve our goals? Which in this case is how do we prevent more and more cases of HIV or reduce the incidence of HIV? Each of your organizations, this, they're devoted to this. So um, I don't particularly have an order, but why don't we start with, with Lisa? Um, Thank you very much, Mike, and hi, everyone. I'm going to um, start by looking at HIV prevention through the lens of the new long-acting um, ARV-based prevention product. And I'm going to see this from two aspects. One, the threats that they actually provide to our HIV prevention program. But then, of course, also the opportunity. And I say threats somewhat provocatively, but also because I do think that we need to think very carefully through how we work with all of these really amazing new products. 
I think the first one is pretty obvious is I think we do run the risk of thinking of them each as silver bullets that are going to solve our HIV prevention challenges. And I think with all the new products on the horizon, this becomes even more of a risk. I think we run the risk of neglecting proven effective prevention interventions like con condoms and DMMC, even more than unfortunately we do at the moment. I think there's a risk of undervaluing the, the role of the daily oral pill and event-driven prep. And really importantly, I think we could become distracted by the cost and the access issues that we already see as a major problem. But having said that provocatively, I do think that the benefits of these new amazing um, ARV-based product, products far outweigh the risks and certainly provide us as a community with great opportunities. And I think the main opportunity really around the HIV prevention field writ large is a renewed energy, increased attention and focus on um, HIV prevention writ large. I think it's made us think more about our recipients of care, about our communities, and I hope that it will re-energize us as the HIV community, as the health community, as healthcare workers, and hopefully also our healthcare services to really think through and reimagine re HIV prevention. I think we will continue to, of course, include treatment as prevention. We've seen an increased effort and energy around that with increasing messaging around U equals U. But I think really importantly not to think of it as an either or, but a both and. I think we have the opportunity to think of people-centered care. We need to think around integration. I think we're already thinking very much through sexual and reproductive health. We certainly need to think around STIs, contraceptives. But particularly in Southern Africa, I think we do need to think of other big pandemics that are coming our way, like the non-communicable diseases. And so I think we need to avoid as our HIV community to be thinking in a siloed way and rather to be thinking of integrated patient-centered decentralized care to increase access and allow choice. And this is all in the context of meeting the great promise that we have of antiretroviral-based prevention. I would just like to give really good credit to our amazing collaborators in South Africa, and Malawi and in Kenya, where we have been doing decentralized um, HIV prevention, serum neutral SOH integrated prep delivery with a daily oral pill. And it's been really encouraging to see what happens when we get into communities. We have projects in Western Cape represented by some people here in a rural and semi-urban KZN, and then in private pharmacies as well. And just seeing when we actually think through what is it that the people need and how can we access them, how we can actually increase uptake of HIV prevention, SOH services, and of course the daily oral pill with the hope of, of the new products coming online. And then just finally to close, I'm, I'm often reminded of my times um, as an intern at Chris Harney Baragwan Hospital in the early 90s, pre-ART. And those were dark days. They were hard for our communities and our healthcare workers. So I didn't expect that. Um, if you told me then that we would have a daily oral pill to prevent HIV, I would have thought that's it, we're done. Silver bullet, yay. Of course, I would have been wrong. And what we've learned over the last 30 years is that science is difficult. We've done amazing things, but delivery and understanding our populations and meeting them where they're at is even more difficult. So fast forward 30 years, amazing progress, huge opportunity. And I really look forward to working the people in this room, colleagues, and the broader community to really realize the, the options we have, old and new, to really bring HIV prevention to our communities. Thank you. Next, we hear from John Blanford, who actually has a particular stress because, as I can foresee, it, he's going to be unemployed, no, unpaid. He'll be employed but unpaid. Um, on Saturday or Sunday, is that, is that been your staff? So you have a stress that none of us, you know, are, as a U.S. government employee, 
Are you have a particular stress? I don't expect you to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about that. The reason all governments have their challenges. I was going to close, but that's no small problem. But John, please. Oh, thank you, and uh, thanks to everybody here in the room. And at least I think I'm I'm starting where you finished off, which is just reflecting back on the tremendous progress, the advancement in technologies over the last four decades, and the fact that. Uh, you as people in the room, the tens of thousands of study participants have gotten us where we're at today. Um, the scale up from, I'm, I'm speaking my opinion, I'm going to take advantage of that, so I'm not going to speak officially on behalf of CDC, but just as someone who's worked in this for a long time. Um, we've had tremendous success in the scale up of ART across the continent. Uh, uptake of PrEP continues, but uh, depending on the country and the context and the subpopulation, we have seen a deceleration in uh, in growth of those on the treatment rolls, uh, and PrEP is nowhere near where it needs to be at um, for the populations in need. And this, so despite the change context in terms of the, the technological innovations we've had in terms of the uh, prevention and treatment uh, options, I don't know that and on two issues, I think we're still struggling. Uh, the public health messaging across the continent hasn't kept the pace uh, with the changing technologies. And secondly, and uh, quite distressingly, stigma and self-stigma uh, continue to be challenges for us. I think on the, on the public health side, one of the things that's been very hard for us to accept is that with proper adherence, we now have, we now know that a single ARV-based intervention can be sufficient for HIV prevention. Um, treatment for positives, prep for negatives uh, with proper adherence. And that's a big caveat. And I, I take uh, full caution of what, what Lisa has, in, has already put on the table. But we also, speaking from public health, we also need to fully embrace that it, it is these individual decisions that are important to where we're going and whether we can influence uh, and embrace the fact that we can empower individual clients, whether uh, peel HIV or those at risk of HIV uh, to adopt and embrace these technologies. Um, combination prevention is a, a, a strategy that's helped us greatly uh, at the population level. I fear that we're still relying on too greatly for our individual counseling of patients and then not empowering them to actually trust in the technologies they have available for them. I, it's too often we have U equals U, but you need to still keep using your condom. Um, prep, but you still need to keep using your condom, as opposed to uh, sort of acknowledging the fact that we have SRH issues, we have STI issues that we need to deal with, and that's motivation for taking the condom, uh, using the condom, but it may not be necessary, it is not necessary for HIV prevention if you use the other technology as well. Uh, and we want to lean into this. The reason I'm saying this is I think this is still at the heart of stigma. We're, we're treating HIV as too big a deal. Um, it's time to start normalizing it, normalizing prevention. The fact that people don't want to take um, uh, PrEP uh, reflects also why people don't want to perceive themselves being at risk for contraception. We need to get away from the association with HIV status and promiscuity, uh, the use of HIV prevention uh, and perceived promiscuity and, and see how we can move on beyond the stigma and self-stigma. I'm worrying that we're at the point in terms of treatment scale up uh, in certain contexts where the, all the people who want to be on treatment are on treatment. Uh, and that we're, we're, we're for working really hard at the margins to bring back people who have fallen out of care to, to, to induce new people to come into care. We need to start changing the demand as well as making uh, the access to services uh, easier. Uh, I, I thought the, the discussion um, Nigel's discussion of the two hour wait for services for syndromic management uh, that resonated with both of us, I think, here. And, and that's a challenge. So we need to find ways to keep, do better at keeping patients out of the clinics, make their experience better, but at the same time, increasing uh, the demand for coming in. Uh, finally, I, I had uh, five things one C and four A's. Uh, <laughs> so choice, agency, access affirmation and affordability, and all these matter. Um, as we found with re, um, uh, contraceptive options, choice matters, different modalities matter. Agency is especially important with uh, AGYW, uh, with commercial sex workers, with PWID, with uh, those at risk of intimate partner violence. 
access, leveraging our services and SRH uh, in the community, uh, BMMC uh, to get other services out to the populations we reach. And then uh, affirmation, and I appreciate Ken Mayer really leaning into this, that we know with our key populations that the, the experience they have in public settings is not great. And we are working on that, but that will be a challenge uh, to getting, uh, it relates back to the access issue, but getting people into our services. And then finally, affordability. And I take Liesl's point completely that this uh, long acting technologies are not a silver bullet, uh, but they're not even going to get to a point of really being substantially important until we can get the affordabilities addressed for this continent. And I'll stop. Okay. I see me you next. Thank you, and good morning, everybody, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. Uh, I'm going to take a slightly different approach, uh, much more strategic approach, and looking at, you know, how do we achieve our HIV prevention goals? And we we, we do have the UNAIDS um, uh, 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 targets that have been set for 2023. Five, and this is something that we all are going to be grappling with as we move forward. Uh, these new targets are, are an intermediary approach to actually achieving the 2030 targets. And so, you know, really, it's it's a long pathway ahead. But unless we we we, we are, you know, looking at these targets as strategically, we're not going to achieve them. Uh, these new targets imply a new approach to HIV prevention uh, that emphasizes appropriate, person-centered, prioritized, effective combination HIV prevention within a framework that reduces existing barriers. And we've heard a lot about barriers uh, in the last two days, and I think you know everybody is aware of those. And, and what we do know is that people are faced with various challenges and need to have choices around HIV prevention. Um, these HIV prevention targets have implications for HIV programs, both for delivery and for monitoring and evaluation and for setting local and national priorities and for domestic and global funders. And this is something that we need to think about in terms of if we are going to be achieving it, what is the pathway? And so the, the Global HIV Prevention Coalition developed an HIV Prevention 2025 Roadmap and set 10 steps for us to actually follow and, 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 and look at how do we achieve this. And I think the first thing that is really important for us is to actually conduct a data-driven assessment for HIV prevention programs, needs, and barriers. So using data to determine, you know, and, and, and using disaggregated data to actually look at where do we, what are our challenges and where do we want to go to. Uh, also taking stock of what are these barriers that we faced with and, and how do we make sure that we address these as we move forward. The second uh, uh, step in, in, in terms of uh, this that we need to follow is to adopt a precision prevention approach that focuses on key and priority populations. We've heard about priority populations, but how do we reach these populations? Where are they? What interventions they need? And every population group or every geographic area does not need the same set of interventions. How do we prioritize those? Then looking at what investments are needed to be able to, to, to achieve these. Um, and, and, and I think here, prioritization allocations for different interventions. And of course, we have limited resources. So we need to look at where do we get the best bang for our buck? you know, and, and, and looking at what resources are available and how are these distributed. And then looking at leadership. If we don't have good leadership to actually drive this process, we're not gonna get there. And so this is really important, investing in making sure that we have leadership that, that enhances collaboration, that coordinates all of the activities so that we can actually achieve what we need to. Um, 
removing social and legal barriers to HIV prevention services uh, and, and for key and priority populations is absolutely critical. And we've heard that, you know, we can had spoken about transgender populations. We heard about, you know, sort of uh, harm reduction programs. So there's a number of different interventions that we need to look at. How do we make sure that while we prioritize these interventions, there aren't legal barriers to achieve those. And then looking at uh, instituting mechanisms for rapid introduction of new HIV prevention technologies. And this is something that we need to think about quite carefully. I mean, everybody in this room is busy working on new intervention, uh, new interventions, new technologies. But if, if we don't have mechanisms to implement them as quickly as possible, they will go nowhere and we're not going to have any impact. And I think that this is where these studies that you are currently engaged with in the HPTN network is to actually look at, as you develop these uh, and, and, and show the evidence, the pathway to implementation also needs to be clearly identified. And then looking at real-time prevention program monitoring systems with regular reporting, if you're going to be using a data-based approach, you have to have proper monitoring systems for HIV prevention. We're quite good when it comes to treatment, but when it comes to prevention, there are big gaps in how we monitor it. And then lastly, to actually just make sure that there's accountability to all stakeholders. How do we make sure our healthcare users, our communities and everybody else is involved? And, and I think that for me, um, I'll just end with the fact that what does success look like for HIV prevention? We need to have a people-centered precision prevention uh, responses with 95% of people at risk of HIV use appropriate prioritized effective combination prevention and that we have fewer than 370,000 new HIV infections. And I'll end. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that's been uh, Ruth, uh, Grace. Thank you so much and good morning, everyone. So I want to reflect a little bit from both implementation and advocacy perspectives. And from yesterday, we learned several things. First of all, when we look at HIV treatment targets, we seem to be doing very well. And I think it's been echoed several times. But when you look at HIV prevention targets, we are really not on track. Uh, we are expected to have less than 370,000 new HIV infections by 2025. But when you look at where we're at now, we're at about 1.3 million. We've got two years to go, and that will need a lot of effort. When we also look at combination prevention in terms of coverage for key populations, we are not doing so well. There was a conversation around people who inject drugs. Right now, when we look at where we're at, we're at 37% coverage. It's still very low. And all these gaps, Lily, are coming within the context of financing that is either flatline budgets or gaps that are very critical in terms of financing these products. So when I think about what are the priorities, for me, some of the issues have been echoed, but I just want to emphasize three things. There's been a conversation around choice. There's been a conversation around inclusion. And there's a conversation around community. And when we talk about choice, let me just call out a new resource that is available out there. It has been launched early this month by the African Women Accountability Board called the Choice Manifesto. This too is calling for research and development that takes a choice-centered approach. What that means is we acknowledge that research has given us powerful tools, powerful products that are working. We need to acknowledge that. But at the same time, we know that we still need more in the method mix. So we also know and understand very well that one product will not do it all. The longer acting methods are very critical, but seasons of risk are different. So the event-driven products are also critical. So questions around all this need to be addressed. We need tools that are user-friendly. We need tools that as a woman I can use confidently. You know, so and when you start looking at even much purpose technology, I've worked with sex workers for a very long time. And when you talk to a sex worker, what is very important for you? You take HIV, you take pregnancy, you take STIs. Trust me, HIV will not be on number one. So we do need this much purpose technologies because at the end of the day, we'll be able to address things that communities are concerned about. So choice need to be at the center of our programs. Choice need to be at the center of our research. 
If we do not address this, we'll have these options that are not translating into results. And that's not what we want. Secondly, when we look at inclusion and diversity, we know there's a commitment that we should leave no population behind. And it's a core even for researchers. A few, a few years ago, there were concerns around exclusion of certain populations. We talked about uh, pregnant people. We talked about people who inject drugs. That might be different in the next two years. And let me say thank you so much to HPTN for being proactive in addressing this concern. But at the same time, in the next two years, transmission might be occurring in another population. So we need to be using API data that is coming in to know where research should go which populations should we be focusing on, which questions should we be addressing, and most critically, geographies, where should we be going? So leaving no one behind means now, but it also means being intentional of engaging the various marginalized communities. Where are possible creating platforms and spaces where we are intentionally working with them. It also means preparing your sites very well in terms of working with this population, because working with a sex worker, working with someone who injects is very different from working with other populations. How are we preparing our staff within these sites? What is the language that we're using in those sites? All these things are very critical. And where possible, where key population can read, we've learned in Implementation World that where you have key population programs, adolescent girls programs, where they're leading, we achieve more. And where there are opportunities to have them incorporated within your programs, let's bring them on board because we're going to know exactly how to tell our programs and how to tell our research. And finally, communities. I think I'll do injustice for me if I do not talk about communities. Because when you look at communities, this is something that we all talk about. But we continue to talk about this because we do not design products for themselves. Products are for people. They are only as effective as the way they are being used. So we need to make sure that communities are at the center of the research. They are at the center of the programs that we're doing. Let's take time to listen to the voices. What does it matter to them? What are the priorities for them? Can we incorporate all this thinking within that? So it's very important for us as we move forward to keep on engaging communities. We do have a tool in terms of good participatory practice. We need to go back to the drawing board. Is there anything we're doing right? Is there anything we're not doing right? We want to acknowledge that you're doing so much good work, but there's always room for improvement in terms of how we engage communities. So this needs to continue and we do acknowledge all the work that you're doing. Finally, just to say, Lily, thank you for the work that you do. As someone who has been on the front line working with sex workers, I've seen the power of these products. I've seen how it changes lives, how it's no longer about the numbers, but someone's life transforming. So for me personally, I really wanted to say thank you for the people in this room, for the commitment to the science and the research that has gotten us here. But also we'll continue to look after you to create synergies. Synergies not only in research, but connect those dots to policy, connect those dots to communities, because in so far as these things come together, that's when we start achieving more. Thank you so much. I, I guess Grace has thought about the subject a little bit. Um, because that was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, let me, we just have a few minutes for conversation and questions. So first, does anyone have the courage to go to the microphone and say something? Yes. This this please introduce yourself. Um, good morning. My name is Amelia and I'm representing community. And thank you, panelists, for presenting. And thanks, God, we have the Department of Health FA in this meeting today. A key question is um, Hasina, you present the person centered and global steps that we should be looking at. But it's also interesting that every time we are in this meeting, we hear about new guidelines and we see less in terms of the impact that the guidelines are making in response to HIV and AIDS, particularly in the key population, in young girls and key population. Um, so I'm not sure because it's interesting to have the department in this platform to engage, um, but I'm not sure at what level of commitment 
does it translate to the implementation of the products that we talk about in the ground? I'm saying that because I visit most of communities, not only in, South, in, in Cape Town, but in South Africa. And I know um, we have a problem with rolling out the prep, the oral prep. Rolling out is not a problem, I'm sorry, but the, the access of, of oral prep is a problem in South Africa. One, the limitations around the NIMAD system is problematic for us as young people to access prep in our facilities. Two, we see it as the department enjoys not to give people prep because there are no interventions to do away with the system that is blocking the accessibility. But again, the idea to prioritize, to have key population was to do the priorities and to make sure that we talk to them. Um, we have seen from the 1990 achievements that were far, we are not achieving. Um, are we going to continue with this as business as usual? And now we are talking about injectable prep vaginal ring and excitingly, the injectable antiretroviral program. And the department is quiet. Your silence is too loud. We are not hearing what you are doing about the accessibility and the availability. Kabele was registered when in South Africa. And how far are we, what facilities other than the, 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 the service providers? What facilities are we preparing? Are we even ready? to provide the injectable prep as South African government or as South African communities. Just the last part. Um, can you acknowledge that we have key population, particularly the LGBTI persons within our communities? By that, I mean, we need to make sure that we service the LGBTI people as LGBTI, instead of asking them to be a female and male in every facility that we go to. Instead of the, the guys are struggling to access the hormonal therapy and even the services that speaks to them in our facilities. And yet we continue to have the Department of Health in the panel discussing or presenting the guidelines that are not speaking to us as people of South Africa. Um, in fighting the, the stigma and discrimination, you guys are adding to it, unfortunately. You guys are adding to it just the last part. Um, now the country is talking about VNEBS. Nation is talking about VNEBS. The NEBS are talking about, the, the whole world is talking about VNEBS. We are struggling with our facilities that cannot provide the injectable prep. Why are you quiet? Why are you quiet about things that speaks to HIV prevention in our country? Are you enjoying this uh, in, increasing number of HIV prevalence and HIV incidents among young people? Till when are we going to be in this? Thank you, thank you. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> Do you want to respond? Uh, okay. But, but don't, I mean, it was more of a comment than a question. So could you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that, yes, our health system is not perfect. And uh, just to say that from the Department of Health, and, and I want to just talk very specifically to oral prep, which is at the moment, the only biomedical product that has been made available. And it's and and in three years since um, it was registered, it was rolled out in all public uh, primary healthcare facilities. At the moment, eighty-one percent of our public primary healthcare facilities are offering oral prep, and this is offered in routine primary healthcare services. We have uh, over one point two million HI uh, oral prep initiations that have taken place. Uh, since we started uh, scaling up oral prep. And I also just need to say that when it comes to oral prep, it lays down the groundwork for including new HIV prevention products, especially looking at Cabale or the Depoverine ring. The issue of Cabale, and, and, and this is, I'm quite sure there are many people in this room that are aware that there is a global unavailability of CAB. So it's not something that the department has control over. It is something that, and I wish there was somebody here from Viv that would, could actually, or GSK, that could actually talk about the availability of CAB because this is not something that we have uh, sort of created. It is something that if it is available and, and, and we can procure it and we can make it available, that is something that we would definitely consider. But at this point, there's too many unknowns. We don't know what the cost is. We don't know what the availability is. And we don't know what the supply is. 
from a public health point of view, those are critical elements. And then just to talk about the issue of uh, uh, stigma and discrimination. And I think, you know, that is something that we need to probably all look at uh, addressing, not just the Department of Health, because it is fairly pervasive. But yes, I do acknowledge that that does require special attention. And with regard to BNABs, I think we're very far away from it at this point. It hasn't been approved and we don't have any approved product. So I can't really talk about that at this point. Thank you. Did you want to say something, John? Before? Yeah, I was just, gonna, just to add, um, because we, I, so I'm, I'm here for CDC. We work, we are here on the HIV side, working under PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, and obviously work closely with the Department of Health. So just say the same way, we have been absolutely supporting the, the PrEP rollout of, of oral PrEP, uh, especially through our, our DREAMS program for adolescent, adolescent girls and young women, and increasingly adolescent boys and young men, and through our key population targeted programs. Uh, so for injection drug users, for sex workers, um, for um, MSM and TG persons. And so we, are, we continue to look to scaling up uh, with this, but we are we work hand in hand with both CDC and USA through PEPFAR. Thank you, Jen. Neil, you have a comment? Yeah, I have a very quick question. Uh, perhaps mostly to Hina, perhaps to John. We've talked about investments for HIV prevention. What percentage of those funds or investments are actually provided by the local government? So the local country governments, either South Africa or uh, you know Zimbabwe or Zambia. Any idea on that, or is it all global funds and um, International funds that support this. <laughs> so, so just to say, and 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 I will I will again refer to. I mean, if we're looking at funding for HIV programs in South Africa, it is largely funded by the South African government. Um, if we look at, uh, and and I just want to look at our prep as an additional option that was brought or that was funded by government. It is more or less in terms of the commodities, which is the labs and the HIV tests, as well as the, 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 the drugs that are used for um, uh, 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 oral PrEP. It's more or less 95% funded by government. There may be about 5% you know, in terms of other resources, but when it comes to donor funding, the donor funding is more in terms of HR, in terms of uh, out, you know, outreach programs, in terms of key populations, but 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 the largely the most the majority of the funding comes from the South African government, and I can't speak for other countries. I think it it you know that is something that perhaps some of the other countries may want to respond. To. Uh, I was going to say yeah, it will vary greatly across the continent, but here in South Africa, I believe it's like um, uh, eighty percent or greater of the resources. That go to support the HIV prevention and and response funds come from the government yeah. of South Africa at various levels. Uh, and and so we'll, donors are only a, a quarter. Of, thank you, Jen. And we'll, I'll ask you each a question really quickly in the interest of time. But, but this is quite a this is an un, a question that's unanswerable. So there's no right answer. There's no test about this. You're here with the network. Uh, the network does what it does. You're familiar with what we what we've done over the years. What do you want us to do? Okay, like in other words, you you talk. I'm 100% sure and say, why don't they do this or why did they do that? I would very much like to hear, starting with my friend of the Gates Foundation, what do you want us to do? We have we have access to NIH dollars sometimes in any of the spaces you're talking about. We're mostly tool makers, you know, the cabinet of the table. But but, <laughs> but but on the other hand, tell us what you want us to do, which is the whole purpose of this meeting. Wow, thank you, Mike. Um, so thank you, firstly, for the tools. And I, I really do just want to emphasize the huge amounts of efforts. I'm um, Sinead points out all of you in the room who work so hard, clinical trials are not easy. It's hard work. So thank you for the tools. I think it's, it's the holding intention, that piece around absolutely we need the tools, but how are they going to show up in people's lives? What, what does it really mean on the ground? From the very beginning, we spoke about pregnancy, but I think there are many other issues. You know, we're assuming, for example, um, to be once again provocative, that a, an injection every two months is going to be really acceptable. We know it was great in the trials, but what does it mean on the ground? So I guess it's holding that intention, but I do think that you already do that. 
But I think more and more, we're going to have to start thinking around that. And I think the integration really is going to be important. I don't think, given our shrinking fiscus generally, and frankly, shrinking attention on HIV, that we can afford to be siloed. We really need to think around integration. Thanks. Thank you. Chan, what do you want us to do? And you're, you're I was hoping you'd jump to the other side of the table. <laughs> um, I, 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 think, I think the biomedical tools, uh, I'm, I'm continually playing catch up. And I appreciate that, that the, the new biomedical tools that are coming, the new uh, opportunities. I'm very excited to hear about some of the developments in the STI space and the opportunities there. I started my public health career in uh, STIs and uh, other than HIV. So I think that's all very important. I think also, and what I was trying to emphasize, is the questions around what are the, uh, the behavioral context? How do we motivate the adherence? Uh, how do we motivate the, the full uptake? And really, uh, really take apart the stigma and discrimination. And because and, I think those are the pieces we're going to start plateauing on the tools um, in terms of how their additive are going to actually change things unless we actually get the the access and the uptake that we need to to have them implemented effectively. Asina. Yeah, I, I think for me, what's quite important, and, and it was a point that Sinead had made around pregnant women, and this has been a big issue, and it was a lesson when we when we started implementing oral prep, uh, when the pro, uh, 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 oral prep was registered by SAPRA to uh, 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 be offered as a prevention intervention. Uh, Pregnant women are excluded, and it, it, you know we had quite an uproar from everybody on that one, and and I think you know for me the fact that we are including and we finding mechanisms to make sure that pregnant women are not left out. The other group that often get left out is the under 18s, you know, and 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 that is another high risk group that uh, is, you know, that we really need to pay attention to. So we need to make sure that, you know, those two priority populations are not excluded in studies and that they are uh, 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 included and we have evidence that these interventions would work for those. And then I think the other big issue for me is looking at the cost of some of these. And I know, I know, you know, you don't get involved with the actual cost of a particular product, but if a product comes in and it is totally unaffordable, you know, and, and, and you're setting us up. <laughs> so we need to think about that. And we need to say, if there is a product that is not going to be affordable, okay, what, what do we need to, what, what do you guys, what guidance do you need to provide to the product developers as part of your, your, your studies to actually look at, you know, is this a niche product? You know, and, and if it is a niche product, who are we targeting right. and, and what should we be doing? Because those people that need it, then won't have access to the product. Great. Thank, thank you. And Grace? Uh, thank you so much. So I think at the moment, the research agenda has basically, the pipeline has moved upstream. We have more products in phase one preclinical. I think what we'd want to see is how you move the agenda of some of the products that are in the early phase trials, moving them forward. Because we talked about making sure that we have a better method mix. But for that to happen, we still have a lot more products that still need to be moved along. So investment in that area remains critical. And finally, also looking still at intentional engagement with communities. Uh, I was excited yesterday when I listened to Deborah around the next generation trial designs, uh, very important conversation, very complex. Sometimes the language gets you know, over our heads, but it's very critical for us, for communities to engage in that as well. So we need to start understanding what is the, because when you look at uh, some of the ethical issues around what we knew then, it's shifted, it's different. What are some of the community perspectives around next generation trial designs? So we want intentional engagement with, 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 with communities as you move forward with the, with the agenda. Thank you. Uh, I can just say real quickly, I think that, well, first of all, thanks to all your comments are very enlightening. I would say that unequivocally the network is, is understands about implementation and trying to understand whether the NIH will support the network working on implementation. Some things we do are in that space, but that's not traditionally the space that NIH looks at. They, they see the CDC as, and no offense to John, they see handed off, it's you. <laughs> <Right. laughs> 
The same way the network is absolutely committed to STD and HIV unsiloed. That is, this is obvious from this meeting. We really see an opportunity to, to make a contribution, and that, that ought to happen. So third, the pregnancy thing, women of childbearing age, women of reproductive age, we're, we're absolutely committed to that. Uh, um, that. That is probably the highest priority, among the highest priorities of the network. So all the things that you suggested are things that we really feel committed to. So this is very helpful to hear that we're kind of on the right track. So thank you so much for all your comments. and, and we're, we're